So our first session this morning is to give you kind of an overview uh, around what went into the development of our new strategic plan. Uh, you all have a copy of that in, uh, provided in the, in the bag that you received when you registered. And it's been circulated a number of times previous to this, so hopefully a few of you ha have had a chance to, uh, to read through the plan. I'm going to start off giving you kind of a little bit of an update in terms of, or a little bit of an outline of how we developed the plan. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Robert Wong. Uh, Robert is a consultant who's worked with us uh, throughout the process. Uh, he uh, he's a background uh, in tourism, the tourism program at Georgian College, uh, and he's now an independent consultant uh, working out of Barrie in all tourism-related fields. Now, some of you know that I've designed a, a cycle tour between B and Bs, uh, where we've got a group of B and Bs that participate in that. Uh, and so I kind of met Robert through uh, some of that. He's done a lot of surveying and uh, helped the area people develop cycling products. Uh, he's you know, surveyed uh, different uh, music festivals this summer, which has been a hot issue up in our area. So there's lots of, uh, uh, you know, lot, lots of interesting things we worked on together. So as we got into this process with a strategic plan update, we thought Robert could help us, with some, especially with some of his surveying experience, because we wanted to find out more about the industry. No one had ever done a B&B industry survey. Um, so we, uh, we put something together. Uh, I think mine was 93 questions long. And Robert told me that was far too long, and no one would ever answer all those questions. <laughs> so uh, I think we carved it down to about half that number, uh, which I'm told was still too long. But that's what we went out with. Uh, we worked closely with BB Canada. Uh, they were very helpful. So we were able to access uh, 2,000, about 2,000 B&Bs through BB Canada. And uh, Robert will provide you with an overview of, of some of those results. And uh, a summary of the results is also posted on the FABA website. So maybe you've seen that. Uh, at last year's FABA conference, uh, we did have an opportunity to sit down with our members. We had breakout groups, five different questions that you were asked to comment on. And the answers to those questions were very helpful to us as we tried to prioritize what FABA should be doing and what FABA shouldn't be doing. Um, we then uh, put, I guess in March, we had a workshop where we brought together all the results of the industry survey, what we'd heard from our members. Uh, and the workshop included the board, some past board members, uh, some FABA members who were not on the board, so we had a selection of B&B &B operators. Robert facilitated it. Uh, we had BB Canada there. Uh, we had Ministry of Tourism there, uh, Resorts of Ontario. Uh, so it was, a, it was a broad group of people, uh, a full day workshop, kind of looking at the results of the survey, what were the strengths and weaknesses of FABA, what were the strategic issues we should be focused on. So we came out of that workshop with kind of five, five issues, five focuses, and, and we developed then a number of specific action steps and a time frame around how we wanted to address those things. And that's what's, that's what's set out in the, in the strategic plan um, that was, I guess, circulated to you originally back in the summer. Um, so I have heard back from a number of FABA members, and, and I have made some revisions to the plan. Uh, nothing major, so that's good news. Uh, hopefully that indicates there was kind of wider acceptance of what we were proposing to do. Uh, so we're going to go through... Let's flip to the next slide. Um, so we're going to go first through just kind of an overview of what the, what the industry survey told us, because there were uh, some fairly surprising results. So I'll turn it over to Robert for that. Not only have I been involved in tourism over the years, many, many years, maybe many decades, I've also have had the, um, the opportunity to enjoy bed breakfasts in Canada, in Ontario, and around the world. And I think of a number of the things that Sean mentioned yesterday was about, you know, really figuring out what your capacity and your capability is. And I was just thinking of a, of a um, experience I just recently had in Vancouver, where we stayed at a bed and breakfast. And the capacity and capability was our host, Malcolm. Malcolm actually was an actor. And he hosted this bed and breakfast. And what he was good at was he was good at listening to us, first of all. He understood that we were there visiting our son. And he also listened that we were very interested in local foods and we were very interested in being able to 
have time with our son. So when we talked about that during breakfast in the morning, of which he played the role, he had his chef whites on, because he was an actor, of course, he, um, he said, well, do you know what you might want to do is this backyard and the patio is yours to use while you're here. So we said, oh, that's great. Well, maybe Friday. Friday. And we said, yeah, Friday. We'd like to maybe have dinner with our son. Can we use a backyard? And he said, fantastic. Here, use the barbecue. There's a local organic um, grocer just down the way. There's a, what was it, pasture to plate organic um, uh, food, um, uh, meat place. And he had set us up to have a wonderful evening with our son in the backyard. And the point was, is he helped us generate that experience that was so important at that bed and breakfast. My point here is, when we're looking at FABA and trying to understand where they could go in the future, the first thing we had to do was understand who was our guest. And the guest in this case was the industry itself. Who makes up the bed and breakfast industry? What are the different um, operations that you have? And so we took a peek at that and then tried to drill down further in terms of what were the hot issues about growth of the bed and breakfast industry for Ontario. So we're going to take you through this. First of all, let's talk about how we did it. Well, we did an online survey because BB Canada had a listing of uh, bed and breakfasts in all of Ontario. We identified there were 1,800, approximately 1,800 um, members in that listing that we could reach out to. We sent an invitation to them. We had it open for two weeks and we followed up with two uh, reminders to them. We had 417 B&B operators from across Ontario who uh, responded to the survey. That's 23%. In my world, 23% is a pretty representative sample, and actually we'll look at the numbers in a few minutes, right? It's certainly more than we had in terms of FABA members. And we found if we only looked at FABA members, we'd be talking to the converted. We need to look out further than that. Um, we worked closely with Doug and the rest of the board and other members to design the questionnaire, how we're going to do the sampling and some of the analysis. So let's take a peek. This is a very enlightening picture here for you. These are the different regional tourism um, areas within Ontario. There's 13 of them as designated by the province. They represented by numbers here. So that's Bruce Gray Simcoe, that's um, RTO 9, that's Southeast Ontario. Two is Niagara, Huron, Southwestern Ontario, Northern Ontario. York, Halliburton, Muskoka, Ottawa, Kawartha, GTA, and Hamilton. This long bar represents the number of B&Bs that are listed under BB Canada in that geography. The 20 here represents the number of members that FABA has from that geography. The Black bar represents the number of respondents that we heard from, from that geography as well. Your most striking thing that you can see here is we have a lot of room to grow. We can also see which of these geographies have the highest number of bed and breakfasts of which we can grow our membership. And where we have representation, where, for example, we have southeastern Ontario, where we have a huge number of bed and breakfasts, but our representation in FOB is very small, right? Very interesting. So let's take a peek of, about who you are. First of all, let's talk about the innkeepers, you as hosts. Spousal relationships. We hope they're positive relationships. And I, I think you would like to hear this, Tris, that it's the women are the prime operators. Or we, should, we, we were going to put bosses down there, but we figured it was more suitable, and that they're between the ages of, of uh, 45 and, and 75, so quite a, quite a range, right? In terms of the 
B&B business operation, you know, 90% of them are just outside of larger urban centers, 50% of them are in more countryside settings. 90% uh, of them live on the provinces. 90% of them have four uh, rooms or less in which they are uh, making available. 85% of them are open year round. So that's 85% of them, not 100% of them. Two thirds of them have been in operation in less than 10 years. And interesting data here in terms of order of magnitude numbers, 70% of them are earning less than $30,000 in revenue. 25% of them are earning less than $10,000. When we look at another table a little later on, this is very important because Stats Canada has identified the number of B&B owners in Ontario, and it's a very small number. And that's because they use a figure of, through taxation, of greater than $30,000. So that's why we're, we're, they don't show up. This really wasn't, our survey really wasn't about the actual guests of the B&Bs, but we wanted to sort of get an understanding from the innkeepers what were their, what their perception of their guests were and what were the experiences that were driving or motivating those guests to come to their B&B. So certainly, um, guests were coming in all ages, but there were probably more in the, the, the middle age range of, of uh, 40 to 60 years of age. 20% um, were returning guests. That's something you should all be tracking. What percentage are, of your guests are returning? Every year, every three years, within that every three year period, right? Obviously, that's something you want to grow. Where are they coming from? Approximately 80% were coming from Ontario. If we look at tourism in Ontario, that's about right. 80% of our visitation is from uh, Ontario residents traveling within Ontario. This year, it's a little higher because of our dollar. Because of our dollar is much uh, lower compared to the United States and to uh, international markets like Europe, we're a very attractive buy right now. In terms of rest of Canada, it depend upon the different B&Bs, whether that was 5 or 20 percent, and whether some of your market um, visitors were from um, overseas, the U.S. And, and overseas. And it could range from 1 to, to 20 percent. I know some in, let's say, Tobermory, uh, the, the um, north, well, in the Grey Bruce area, they almost have in the order of 60 percent that are international because of the way they've catered their and targeted their property. This is just a, a based upon input from the various businesses, their international guests, UK, the US being first, UK. This pattern generally replicates the pattern of visitation to Ontario for international visitors. That matches it just about perfectly. What are the guests' experiences? What are their motivators? From your point of view, you said, well, it's that more personalized and that friendly experience that they're gaining at your bed and breakfast. It's that, that story that I told you at the beginning. It's that full breakfast that's included. It offers that local atmosphere, and these are things that Sean had mentioned yesterday as well. And possibly you have something unique in terms of the architecture of your particular home. We asked about your marketing activities. This was interesting. 75% use some form of advertising. We always question, what are the other 25% doing? 72% right. had a, their own website. 50% use social media. 46% said they didn't use any social media at all. Traditional print media was used, mostly rack cards, in a relationship with the destination marketing organizations or a local B&B association. And um, only a few, only 20% had worked with the regional tourism organization in their area. Most interesting as well, that 69% 
we're actually packaging their property with some of the other attractions within the area. Something uh, brought up yesterday when Sean was here, the importance of partnerships, right? So this is just replicating what that, those points are over there. Peak of the future. Well, 48% said that they expected their business to increase. This is good. 77% uh, expected to continue to operate their business over the next two or three years. But interesting, 16% expected to sell within that time period. And an additional 7% expected to close. And this is some of the challenges associated with FABA is an attrition factor that's happening. <coughs> Bed and breakfast owners get into, seem to get into this at a latter um, career of their lives. And then at a certain point they say, I'm going to totally retire now, and then they leave. And they're not necessarily selling their business, they're leaving the business. And therefore, that leaves gaps, right? And that was important to figure out. Top issues facing all of you, increasing regulation, accessibility legislation that was coming out, and what was the impact having on your particular business, um, the regulatory reaction to uh, Airbnbs by the municipalities and how that was sort of influencing it, the increasing costs that you have, the technological changes, and the Social media use, can I keep up? Do I want to keep up with those sorts of things? And an interesting one that came out was the guests that you have seem to have a higher expectation. And it's being harder to meet those expectations that they're providing to us. And therefore, who's delivering or, or what type of messages are we getting out to those, those guests that are coming? So. That was sort of the research, and we took all that information, and then we had to distill it. Because what we do best is we take tons of information, and we got to distill it. What does it all mean? And so as part of that, we did a situational analysis. The first thing we had to do was look at what's happening in terms of membership in FABA. This is not a good news story at this point in time. 2009, we're at 202. And we've steadily declined in 2015 for a number of different reasons. There were, and there's a difference between, because things keep changing, five or six local associations of which we had 20 B&B operators actually represented. I'll show you another picture of that in a few minutes. Stats Canada has identified there are 377 B&Bs in Ontario. Well, that's certainly more than what we have. But we know that's not true because BB Canada, at the time when we did this portion of the work, had 1,954 Ontario B&B operations. So there's a huge gap between here and there. And with the um, survey, we identified 244 new introductory members. We offered that as part of the survey to bed and breakfast owners if they wanted to become introductory members of FABA, and we had 244 member or B&Bs identify they were interested. And then the last point in black was, out of all of those, how many other available units or rooms are being available through Airbnb that aren't even being touched by these, okay? This was just the local associations. This is showing with these associations, that represents 242 B&Bs. But really, with these associations, we only have 20 of them, those businesses, that are part of FABA. There's an opportunity lost there, right? We asked um, you folks as well, in terms of your interest in education. 77% uh, said they were interested in some educational webinars. Um, interesting enough, only 80% of them, or 80% of them, had never been to a conference like this. An opportunity as well to grow. These were some of the topics associated uh, in their interest for education. 
website presence and marketing, social media, tax matters, customer service, and introducing uh, the operations of B&Bs. We also had an open-ended question to uh, bed and breakfast um, operators about what they felt the value that FABA could offer to them as a member. And they talked about cost. Um, there are some issues around cost. Uh, if I'm a B&B &B operation, I have many different costs and I you know, belong and associated with a number of different organizations. Which organization is going to deliver the most value to me? Um, some said that they would love FABA to be the voice of the industry. They felt that FABA should have more visibility and if it was better recognized by the B&B owners, that would be useful, as well as, more importantly, guests. If they knew the value that FABA offered, then they would recognize then FABA as the voice of the industry. And last point was the need for um, a role to be played by an organization to advocate on their behalf, whether that's related to um, Airbnb or accessibility legislation or whatever, whatever they said that was an important gap to be, to be um, filled. And these were a number of different things that were talked about. So we took all of that information, then we distilled it. And we had a number of different strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that were discussed at this workshop. And this was developed through the activities of the workshop. We'll just cover a, a couple of them. Certainly there was a strong history of successful advocacy related to, let's say, the Walkerton and the, and the water quality issue years ago. Could FABA play that role again? Um, they had now stronger operational standards that they've got sort of the kinks worked out of it and it was in place. The board was expanding. They had some alliances with resorts of Ontario that were were starting. They now had information with regards to the industry itself and therefore more knowledgeable and that we had 244 new introductory members and that in some cases a few municipalities have consulted with FABA with regards to bylaws in their municipalities with regards to um, Airbnb and therefore FABA was playing a role in that case and that the website was updated. So those were all some of the positive things that are happening. In terms of the weaknesses, well, you have to be honest with yourself when you're looking at these sorts of things in order to look for the future. Well, the FABA and its value were not really known by the public. FABA and its value were not well known by the B&B owners. Although they want to represent Ontario with the numbers of B&B um, businesses right now, they can't say they're represented or they can't say, uh, they can't play that, that total role that, or they can't claim that role yet. There's been some declining membership. There was a high turnover of some B&B um, innkeepers. 25% expect to sell or close in the next um, three to five years. And FABA and the industry really has some difficulty in understanding who are the markets they're trying to serve. Is the markets their guests? Well, your business is to the guests, but FABA's markets are to the B&B owners, to the municipalities they could serve, right? Possibly to the RTOs, of which are an organization within geographies in Ontario and more, okay? What were the opportunities? Well, there was an opportunity to build their membership quickly because of the introductory members and now a better understanding of the B&B industry. Um, they could leverage uh, memberships through these local associations. If we only have 8% of them, we certainly have a lot more room to grow. Um, they could use the insight from the research about the industry, that would be helpful. And Resorts of Ontario could offer them credibility as well as legs to get out there. 
there were additional things uh, from seminars to the conference that were all positive things that they could do. Last of all, after opportunities, are threats. These are items that you don't have any control over, but they, you have to be aware of them when you're doing your planning for the future. And that's the introduction of Airbnbs. Where is that heading? How can we be involved? Um, the younger demographic, are they really interested in the B&B? And how do we engage that younger demographic into that? And I'm seeing, quite frankly, the millennials are really almost turning a corner where they are very interested in some local foods. They are becoming more interested in local experiences. And therefore, how do we capture the local, the local demographics? Fluctuations in our currency. We have a good side going on right now. What's the future going to be? Government and re regulations and then guest expectations. We can't control those, not all of those, but we have to be aware of those. So pulling all of those things together, you can't do all things for all people. So part of the strategic planning work is to narrow it down. So we narrowed it down to five different areas. And the best way to look at those issues is to express it as a question. So the first one is for FABA. How do we convert new introductory members and grow new members in local BNB organizations? That's the number one priority because if you can't grow your membership, then you can't say you're the voice of the industry. And because we have the introductory members, then this is an opportunity to go after what we consider the low-hanging fruit to build the membership up, right? How can we work with Resorts of Ontario to deliver more member benefits, whether it's for marketing, administrative support, advocacy, education, to the Ontario B&B industry? It's a great relationship, or at least it's the beginning of a relationship. It looks like it's a great relationship. How do we leverage more of that so you see the value of that relationship and others in the B&B industry see that value? Seems to be some lots of discussion in the past with regards to the inspection and rating system. What should we call it? How does the public view it? How do the B&B industry view it? And we certainly talked about that is considered one of the values that FABA offers, but we have to communicate that better. And maybe we should be talking about that as quality assurance as opposed to rating. Fourth, how can we enhance the brand with the public, the RTOs, the DMOs, municipalities, and the provincial government? Because really, we need the brand to stand out so the public becomes aware of it so that when they are searching for B&B experiences, they recognize FABA introduces and offers them quality assurance in that area. And that's one of the challenges that B&B operators are really trying to wrestle with. And last of all, how can we deliver uh, value on educational topics quickly to the memberships? So those are the five different strategic areas. And now Doug is going to take it the next about what have they done. So pass it back to Doug. You know, we looked at those five issues, but before we even came up with our action plan, we did kind of look at the mission and purpose of the organization. It was last identified uh, in the, I think it's 2008, as part of that strategic plan. Um, and there was a lot we liked about you know, that purpose and that mission, but they were very broad. Um, and, and probably too broad for an organization the size of FABA uh, and reliant on a volunteer board. So, we thought we wanted to focus it down on something that was far more achievable um, and, and kind of reflected some of what we'd heard in the survey. Um, you know, we, our, our vision of uh, like-minded uh, B&B operators delivering unique travel vacation experiences. You know, those are the types of things you heard Sean mention yesterday. Um, our mission was not to be all things to all people, but it was to support the interests of B&B operators. Um, we wanted to set a quality standard, you know, that's when FABA was born in 1987, 
it was in relation to regulatory threats that could have resulted in the you know, basically outlawing of B&Bs in Ontario. The organization was formed to show the government that yes, we could set standards, we could enforce quality. And you know, we had a lot of members back in those days. Um, over time, the membership has declined. The regulatory threat kind of went away, although maybe it's coming back now. But uh, uh, over, the, over the years, the, the membership declined. Uh, there wasn't a lot done to grow membership. We, we kind of relied on B&Bs to find us, as opposed to going out and finding them. Um, so, you know, we thought uh, as we develop our plans, increasing membership is, is, is one of our number one issues, and I'll, I guess I'll come to that in a minute. Um, and of course the values that we live by. Hospitality lives here has been kind of a catchphrase. I'm not sure when it was originally introduced, but it's a great phrase that really, really summarizes what B&Bs are all about. People come to B&Bs to experience that personal hospitality, uh, you know, that home feel, they, they really, something they cannot find at commercial hotels. And it, it really all, it's all embodied in that to hospitality lives here motto. Um, so that's part of it. The other part of it, of course, is that as an industry, or as an industry association, we want to focus on the needs of our members and what we think are the needs of our industry. So the number one uh, issue that Robert mentioned was increasing membership. We knew we had to do something. Uh, as a volunteer board, you know, we couldn't, we didn't want to just sit down and start cold calling B&Bs. That's not how we want to spend our time. We, and, and we didn't want to go out and hire staff to do that. We didn't think that approach was going to work. But we knew that there were, the industry survey told us there were all kinds of different B&Bs out there. Some, you know, I guess the, the revenue numbers tell it, uh, over 70% have revenues of less than 30,000. Um, so there are a lot of B&Bs that are very small, 25% less than 10,000. It's unlikely that a B&B at that level is going to be too interested in joining local member, or joining local or provincial associations. They're not spending a lot of money on marketing because they can't afford to. Um, but some of the larger organizations, or the, some of the larger B&Bs, will be interested in you know, what they can get out of a, of a provincial or local association. Uh, some of the interesting marketing things they can do. Um, so there's, there's more opportunities for us in, in, in the larger organizations. Um, so what we did in terms of trying to attract new members was to develop this new concept of introductory membership. A lot of you here today are introductory members. We wanted to give B&Bs an opportunity to find out what FABA was all about. Um, you know, rather than have people join and have to go through the inspection process and rating process up front, uh, take a year, find out what we're about, get our newsletter, uh, learn what you have to do to prepare for inspection, and then decide whether you want to become a member or not. Um, so we offer the introductory membership, uh, first of all, to people who completed the survey. That was kind of a nice giveaway. Uh, but on a go-forward basis, any new B&B that lists on BB Canada will be offered introductory membership in FABA. So that's a way we can just continue to bring in new and potential B&Bs who uh, are interested in learning about us. They'll have a one-year trial period, then if, if uh, they're interested, they will convert to full membership and will complete the inspection process at that time. Uh, associations. You know, there are uh, you know, a number of really good local associations out there, but they're all quite different. You know, some, some need the support uh, of a provincial association uh, and may want to piggyback on some of the marketing that we do. Uh, you know, but others, uh, you know, Brian, or David is here from Niagara. Um, you know, Niagara and Stratford are kind of unique associations, very tied in very closely to local theater festivals. So they get a large number of people being drawn in and, and that's their target market. Uh, and when those festivals are on, they're busy. Uh, when the festivals close, things are quiet and they probably breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> but, but their needs are different. Um, so we have to try to you know, figure out how we work more closely with those local associations to give them the types of benefits that their members want. You know, I don't need all the local association members to join FABA because they may not need a five-star rating to sell rooms. Uh, but we want to deliver benefits for those association members. 
Uh, and, and we'll have some ideas on that that we'll, uh, we'll develop over the course of the year. Um, communicating member benefits. Uh, we have worked on uh, enhancing the website, and you've been getting probably more regular newsletters with uh, more information in them. Uh, we'll continue to do that. And then we'll just continue to annually look at how this is going. Uh, when we look at the numbers, and we think this association should have you know, more than 200 members, uh, even, even if you look at the larger B&Bs in Ontario, say 30% of them have revenues of more than 30,000, then you're looking at five to 600 B&Bs, which a good portion of those should be FABA members. Um, we also had to deal with kind of our capacity. Uh, that was something, again, Mark, or uh, Sean mentioned yesterday. Uh, we're a volunteer organization. We're all running our own B&Bs, but we are committed to trying to improve the industry, try to represent the industry on a provincial basis. But it's, it's, it's really difficult uh, relying completely on volunteers for these things. So uh, over the last number of years, we've had representatives from Resorts of Ontario attend our conference. We've gotten to know each other a little bit better. Uh, and in, in May of, of last year, May of 2015, uh, we signed a memorandum of understanding with them that basically allows us to uh, uh, share some of their services. Uh, we now have FABA based in the Resorts of Ontario office, so we do have an office. Not that we use it a lot, but our sign is on the wall. Um, more importantly, uh, Michelle answers the phone when you call FABA. So we do have some administrative support on a part-time basis that allows us to move some of our programs forward more, effic more efficiently than we did in past. Um, we wanted to give our members the ability to do more marketing if they chose to. Not all members have a budget or a desire to market their B&Bs, but some do want to spend money and do want to attract the type of guests that you know, fit into the, the vision you have for your B&B. Well, Resorts of Ontario has a, a numerous different marketing programs, and you as an individual B&B can buy into those programs should you choose to do so. And Grace is going to be on later this morning to talk about some of those programs. Um, so I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that to her. Um, the other area we looked at was the Preferred Supplier Program. Doug Rowling's is here. Uh, we've just launched that, but it's a great, it's an easy way to give our members access to some of the uh, preferred suppliers they've got on their list. And joint conference. Uh, Diane and I both attended the, uh, the Resorts of Ontario conference last April. Uh, very similar format to our conference. Similar type speakers. Actually, some of the speakers from that conference you're going to see here today. And Sean yesterday was a speaker at that conference. Um, you know, they also have their AGM over lunch. Very, very similar format. We thought an easy thing for us to do is to, going forward, have a joint conference with Resorts of Ontario. All the administrative aspects of the conference would be handled by the Resorts of Ontario office. B&B owners and FABA would still be allowed. We would have our own annual general meeting as part of the conference. We would have our own breakout groups if we, choose to, if we chose to. Or we could just go to the uh, sessions that the Resorts of Ontario group put together. So it still gives us a lot of flexibility, but it removes all that administrative you know, overhead or administrative time that the volunteer board has to, has, to, uh, has to take on. And that's not really where we want to spend our time. Uh, you know, we'd rather spend our time doing the things that you think is important. So if this is a more efficient way we can do our annual meetings, this, this is what we're going to pursue. Uh, the star rating. You know, if we are... If we are asking FABA members to go through our, first of all, subscribe to a level one inspection or level one, you know, level one standards and quality, that you need to, you need to go through that just, just to become a FABA member. But we then move on to level two, where we've developed and, and over the last few years refreshed as sort of an amenities-based rating system. Uh, that is designed to you know, award a star, a star rating to the organization anywhere from one to five. Um, and it's to give you something that you can then use to market your organization, to give the public some indication of, of, of what type of a and b they're going into. Um, many people are motivated by, uh, they want something quick and convenient. 
you know, maybe two, three stars, maybe five stars is what they're looking for, but it's a way to kind of communicate to the public what, they're, uh, you know, what they can expect from this B&B. &B. And uh, used properly, I think the five star rating system can be very helpful to individual B&Bs, but it's not helpful, or not particularly helpful, if the public doesn't know about it. So we need to, you know, we need to market the FABA brand. We need to make the public more aware of you know, what we're all about, you know, what, what the name means, what the five-star rating system means. Uh, and so that means uh, we want to spend some additional time advertising FABA itself, um, you know, enhancing, I say, our online presence, uh, and maybe some coming up with uh, a new print brochure or rack card that can be distributed through our member B&Bs, through some of the trade shows that Resorts of Ontario attends through the Ontario Travel Information Centers. There are a number of ways we can distribute that. Um, I think a lot of our marketing plan is also based on piggybacking on what Resorts of Ontario does. They are, Grace will correct me if I'm wrong, I, I kind of call you a, a digital marketing organization where they're all about attracting travelers to their site trying to sell experiences to the guests and push that out to the member resorts. So they generate traffic for the member resorts. FABA wants a bigger place on that website so we can participate in some of that traffic. We'll, we'll, we'll send visitors to the FABA website and to your individual websites. So that's ki kind of our objective over the, next, over the next year, to put something like that in place so we'll do more digital advertising through Resorts of Ontario. We'll do some print advertising in their magazine, the Go Resorting magazine. Uh, and we'll look at our own piece that will be distributed through uh, travel centers, trade shows, and your own B&Bs. So it's a, it's a plan that's still at its, its initial phase, but we'll keep you up to date on where it's, where it's going to go over the next year. Uh, Increase use of logo. Well, one of the best ways to market ourselves is to make sure you're all using the logo. I go to a lot of FABA member B&B websites and I can't even find the logo. So use it. Every, everything you do, if you have your own rack card, you have on your websites, on your Facebook page, use the FABA logo. It does appear on your BB Canada listing, and we do make sure that happens. But the more we use it, the more people are aware of it, and the more it means something to the public. Uh, member videos. Um, we, we've recorded some member, uh, some member videos that we will be posting on the website, uh, but I know Mary has some ideas around you know, helping each of us create our own uh, video that we may post on our own website and on your FABA webpage. So that's, again, something we're, we're developing, um, but I think something we can provide to you all at a very, very reasonable cost. Um, and we also, on, on, back to the associations, um, most of the associations, I know Stratford and Niagara being large associations, um, you know, they also have their own inspection procedures. Most of the association inspection procedures were based on the FABA level one inspection. Uh, so, or if they are different, they're not all that different. We want to make sure that our procedures are aligned with the associations. There's no point, you know, if I've got someone from Niagara who wants to join FABA, there's no point starting at ground zero. I might just as well accept what they've done in Niagara, you know, and, and then just look at the star rating if that's what they want to do. So working, working more closely with the associations, I think, will, uh, will help us with our partnership there. Um, advocacy. Yeah, as I said, this is where FABA was born, sort of issues around regulation. And they are, uh, they are becoming more and more important to us. Uh, we had four or five municipalities contact us this year, all proposing new regulations, all as a result of complaints uh, raised because of Airbnb, B&Bs. Um, so Dawn will have more to say about that later this morning. Uh, but we have had more meetings. We have been in touch with the Ministry of Tourism, and 
we will have, well, I'm going to leave it to Dawn to talk about what we're planning to do, but it's becoming a hotter topic. Um, and then looking at other tourism organizations. As Robert mentioned there are 13 RTOs across the province, and in addition to those RTOs, you probably have local tourism organizations in your areas. We want to make sure we, they know about us and we know about them. How can we work together with uh, these groups? And when we're meeting with them, we don't want to, you know, I don't want to meet with them all. Uh, I'm, I'm in RTO 7, so I know the RTO 7 people. But if we're going to organize something with RTO 4, one of the other ones, I want to involve some of the local B&Bs in, in those areas. And, you know, let's, let's talk about what the priorities are in RTO 4 and uh, whether B&Bs can play a role. So that's, again, something promoting our partnerships. Member education. Um, I think two newsletters ago we sent something out on changes we'd made to the website. There are a lot more webinars now available on the website and there's a lot more information in terms of where to go. Uh, Bedandbreakfast.com has a considerable number of, of webinars and you can easily access them via our website. Um, there's a, a whole lot of new information for aspiring uh, B&B owners on the public pages of our website. Um, there are numerous people offering courses. Some are in-person courses, some are online courses, but uh, lots of really good information there. Um, we are recording today's sessions. Those of you who have been to FABA before, we've, we've never recorded before. But we are recording some of the sessions and we'll post these on the website so people who didn't attend the conference can access uh, these sessions. Uh, and we'll continue a joint conference with Resorts of Ontario, similar format to what we do now. And we'll try, you know, we'll try to keep the website content you know, up to date and relevant. So what, what will FABA be going forward? Well, you know, we need at least 200 full-time members. Um, I, think it, you know, we've, we, I think with the efforts we're going through, we can start to build that back up again. Um, we want a number of local associations who are willing to work with us, uh, we want to be able to demonstrate those associations there is a benefit to their members of, of at least having their local association as part of FABA. Uh, we will maintain the commitment we have right now to quality. Uh, we will maintain the star ratings, and we, but we want to make sure that they are important and relevant to our guests. So we've got to, we've got to market FABA a little bit better than we have in the past. And, uh, I guess the industry voice. We want to continue to speak for the industry, which means we're, you know, we're a minority number of B&Bs, but I think we will consult with associations. We will do what we can to at least speak for the industry and try to raise issues that we think are important and maintain our relationship with industry partners. So there's, there's a quick overview. Um, there's more information certainly in the, in the package that we handed out.